Hello friends, this is the lecture preparation for July 8th, 2018, the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. I'm on page 215 in your workbook and we begin with the reading from the prophet Ezekiel. Commentary at the bottom. God's spirit, literally wind or breath, a vital energy, enables the prophet to hear God's word. He cannot rise on, of his own volition. The spirit enters and sets him on his feet. So when you, uh, if you uh, look at the comment to the left of that reading, it says, imagine being lifted to your feet and hearing the voice of God. So this, when it says, the spirit entered me and set me on my feet, that means you were essentially levitated, you know, that, that God picked you up and, and you stood up and not of, of your own accord. It was done to you. So it's kind of dramatic. I want that to be in your voice. Um, Further down in that paragraph, it says, Ezekiel's success does not depend on his, uh, his audience's reaction, but on his obedient proclamation. And uh, Israel will know, will know, recognize, and acknowledge that Ezekiel is God's spokesperson only when the, prophet, when the prophecies have been fulfilled. The commissioning represents God's concern and involvement in Israel's life, despite her chronic sin and obstinacy. So, um, so this reading is about you are you have uh, you are in the voice of God most of the time, and um, when it begins with "Son of Man," so bear that in mind. It's a very humbling thing to realize that you are speaking the word of God, but that it is indeed what you are, and that is indeed what you do every time you go to the ambo to proclaim. You can look at some of the comments to the left. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. As the Lord spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking say to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have revolted against me to this very day. Hard of face and obstinate of heart are they to whom I am sending you. But you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they heed or resist, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that a prophet has been among them. The word of the Lord. Short reading, um, and don't don't let it fly by too fast. You have it's so short you have time to really dwell on these words a little bit. Moving on to reading two. After his testimony of mystical experience, Paul confesses the thorn in his flesh that was given to him from becoming too elated by such revelations. The thorn is variously interpreted as a sickness or physical disability like epilepsy, depression, headaches, or eye problems. It might be a persistent temptation or handicap connected with his personal life or apostolic activity. Since the Hebrew thorn in the flesh can refer to persons or echoes the English a thorn in my side, Paul may refer to an obnoxious opponent. The precise diagnosis is not necessary, and its elusive identity makes it applicable for any reader. Paul appeals, Paul appeals insistently three times for its removal, like Jesus in Gethsemane, a sign of how intolerable he felt the thorn to be. His petition is denied. Relief is withheld for a higher purpose. Whatever the thorn was, Paul interprets it as a deterrent prepared by a sinister enemy to remove him from the battle plan, but the effect it has on him is beneficial. It keeps him from being inflated by the gift of private revelations. In this present case, God has co-opted Satan's thorn to help Paul keep perspective and, incidentally, to prove that God is in control. Paul's request that that, that it be removed credits God with the power to remove it, But the denial of the request helps Paul understand the paradoxical relationship of power and weakness. Jesus affirms that suffering will be accompanied by the grace of endurance. My grace is sufficient for you. 
Grace is manifest in the experience of weakness, the cross. Paul pinpoints the ground for the paradoxical strategy he has adopted in his self-defense, that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Romans states it directly, As much as sin may abound, God's grace abounds even more. In another context, Paul's depiction of humans as earthen vessels into which God has poured such treasure shows that the power is from God and not from us. Now, boasting in his weakness, he gives glory to God, the only real power in his life. Christ suffers the ultimate helplessness in his crucifixion, and he is thus the hallmark of God's power, effective in Jesus raising from the dead. So that's a lot packed into that short reading. So it's in, it's uh, incumbent on you that you really make sure that you uh, uh, looked at this. This is a didactic reading. So it's it's a uh, it's a teaching about the strength and uh, weakness, as they just mentioned. Um, I'll let you look at the um, comments to the left, but do look also where it says to keep in mind. To pay attention to the pace of your reading. Varying the pace gives listeners clues to the meaning of the text. The most common problem for proclaimers new to the ministry is going too fast to be understood. So first of all, understand that. You don't want to go too fast. Uh, However, you can go too slow. Um, Particularly if you you read the entire thing at a really slow pace. it does not carry the meaning very well. So um, look at, so basically you will want to emphasize that which is most important. Sometimes there are just some trivial ideas or or elements that are thrown in. Those can go through quickly. But um, again, as we talked before, let's let's look at these bold words as a place to start. Just looking at those is going to slow you down. And um, uh, pay attention to pauses. That'll 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 make a difference in your pace too. Again, um, look at what's most important. I think in this, in the, what's important is the thorn in the flesh. And then he describes it. And then the 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 uh, uh, response to that is, "My grace is sufficient to you." Those are the two main things. And then the final one, because that brings about the final. Uh, response for when I am weak, then I am strong. So make sure that those words stand out. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, that I, Paul, might not become too elated because of the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses, in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Moving on to the gospel, I'll read the commentary at the bottom. The brother of James and through Simon. In Semitic usage, the terms brothers and sisters are applied to nephews, nieces, cousins, half-brothers, and half-sisters, as well as children of the same parents, a usage which also present in Greek translation of the Old Testament. Mark demonstrates what what comprised the greater part of Jesus' earthly sojourn, the routine of a craftsman who shared the conditions of village life. In this glimpse of Jesus in his hometown, we discover the value of daily life as a path to holiness. In his reply, a prophet is not without honor except in his own house. Jesus recalls the the prophets the people rejected, and and in in a view of the dishonor he received from his own townsfolk, he anticipates his eventual rejection by the nation. In the end, Jesus' healing power in Nazareth could not take effect because of the people's lack of faith. 
the gospel informs us that Jesus could not work any miracle there. He just cured some sick persons, a strange observation. On one hand, he could not work any healings in such an environment, and on the other, he cured some few. Why some and not all? Is it not the same Jesus for everybody? Perhaps some of those present had reserved a place for God in their lives and approached Jesus and, and approached Jesus not for the sake of propriety or curiosity, but out of faith. And they enjoyed a friendship with him, friendship expressed in confidence and prayer. A similar tension exists in our lives. Jesus offers us the miracle of full life, a miracle that touches persons open to his presence. What is lacking is our confidence and faith for the miracle to take effect in our lives. So um, keep that in, in mind. Uh, last week, we heard that there was a story of the healing, and it was uh, Jairus's daughter and then also the woman with the hemorrhage. And the, the takeaway from that whole gospel was that faith had been the vehicle for their healing. And in contrast to today's reading, the people did not have faith, and he wasn't able to do much healing. So, you know, I guess it's always a temptation to believe that we somehow, quote, earn, unquote, healing because we have faith. Um, but ultimately, faith is a gift, but we have to be open to receive that, that, that uh, faith. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, Where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given to him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there apart from curing a few sick people by laying hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you all very much and God bless you.